Can you see the screen? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, we can see your screen, but uh, we can't see the presentation. Actually. Yeah, the presentation is. We can yes. see the Yermit window, so you should share the presentation. Yeah. So are you able to see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we can. So uh, welcome everyone to the uh, tutorial week of AIML Sessions 2022. Uh, today's tutorial uh, is given by four people. Uh, Amit Say, Kaushik Roy, both from University of South Carolina. Mahal is from University of Maryland and Baltimore. And Usha Lokala, also from the University of South Carolina. Uh, the topic for today's tutorial is going to be neurosymbolic AI for mental health care. Uh, we have Kaushik and Manas with us. So, welcome, Kaushik. Welcome, Manas. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and effort to speak late into the night. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. And uh, over to the two of you. Okay, so um, I'm Kaushik. Roy, a doctorate student at uh, the University of South Carolina, working at the AI Institute. Um, so I'll get this tutorial started. So just to set up the um, the topics that we'll be talking about, I'll show, I'll run through here a short demo of a chatbot that we have built. Um, so oh. I'll go through the different modules and hopefully by the end of these modules uh, it should be somewhat um, inter interesting to you guys that uh, there is a role to be played uh, in such systems by external knowledge what what i mean by external knowledge you'll see soon so here we see that uh, a user is um, making conversation with this chatbot and on the right hand side panel, you see some an illustration of what is going on in the back end. So we are in the process of creating the profile for the user as the conversation is going on. So once some part of the conversation happens, uh, there is a graph being built at the back. So what kind of medicine does the medication does the user take, for example, and then um wait. yeah so once the uh, medications that the user take is populated in the graph that is um, representing the user's profile extra information about that medication is available in external knowledge bases one example a couple of examples of such external knowledge bases you can see at the bottom it's uh, umls that is uh, a relational database that stands for Unified Medical Language System. And Mayo Clinic is a, a popular um, clinic here in the US where uh, it contains information about uh, a lot of medical uh, illnesses and it's, it, it's also treated there. So uh, the chat pulls information from these two sources and the information that is available to the chatbot you can see on the screen. For example, that fluoxetine is available only through prescription. Um, so if we scroll a little bit forward, um, the role of this kind of uh, information at the back end is for the chatbot to be able to ask questions like, have they prescribed you enough issues? Contrasting this with a regular mental health chatbot, it would not uh, generally think to ask about refills because it does not have the information uh, that is contained in the external knowledge that this particular class of drug is only available by prescription. Right? So with that, um, I'll start the next few slides. So um, yeah. Okay. So uh, a little bit of history on how AI has progressed. First thing that people tried out was what is known as expert systems. So in expert systems, 
uh, basically humans sat down and handcrafted a whole bunch of knowledge like the kind you saw in that demo that these diseases are related to those other diseases uh, and what medications are used to treat them what are their side effects and so on um, those those were all uh, manually handcrafted by uh, a lot of people and um, computation was done over those uh, handcrafted data written as rules so for example to understand if a patient is suffering from a particular mental illness there would be a explicit rule encoded into the system to say that if they exhibit xyz side effects or symptoms then they are suffering from a certain illness and uh, the medical procedure would be followed again that is also encoded as a rule that was the first kind of system expert system now uh, what happened in the machine learning era is after a lot of data was available after the web became a thing um uh, you could um construct automated algorithms that could uh, mine the web data to learn patterns from it and those patterns could drive business decisions like should you uh, intervene for a particular patient in mind at that point so now uh the the problem we are facing in in the current era of artificial intelligence is the automation is fine but exactly what is this automated technique learning does it have the knowledge that the handcrafted expert systems used to have so th that is the conundrum that we are facing right now the handcrafted expert systems were easily explainable that they have these rules so they have these reasoning patterns the automated systems are completely black box there are these statistical patterns that are learned from big data but then what are those patterns can humans trust them so that brings us to the third part which is explanation so with knowledge infused ne neurosymbolic ai we'll hopefully be able to achieve the third one so uh, continuing um so you have this uh, as a the comic that i borrowed from xkcd this is the current state of automated machine learning so there there is a pile of mathematics linear algebra uh, that says that uh the outcome y is related to x in some vector space uh, by um weight modification w so what hap what is the task here learn that weight modification w and if that does not make sense then just change that w that is what that stir pile means here so then what we are going to say uh, further in this tutorial is that uh the methods that we have developed at the ai institute Uh, can hopefully make sense of that pile so the for this tutorial we have made use of uh, data sets available from uh, reddit which is a social media platform uh, here our uh, one of the tasks that we deal with is mental illness so reddit is a, a platform where mental health posts are found in abundance uh, and also it has increased Uh, since the uh, covid pandemic happened because the mental health care uh, system has been overextended so people have taken to social media platforms to vent their frustration um some of the classification models we'll be discussing are uh, what we're calling process knowledge infused classification and knowledge infused classification in uh, standard uh, language models such as bert so we'll see more in more detail what i mean by all that um so uh, the questions that we'll answer to begin with is uh, trying to elaborate on the terms so first we'll what is neurosymbolic ai and then why is it necessary and then uh, why would we require external knowledge infusion in neurosymbolic ai and then what are some of the methods that we can use to train such methods and what are the data uh, what is the kind of data required so first The, a burning question that is present in today's uh, AI community is: it is almost divided uh, into two parts. One is those that think that black box models can black box models can achieve everything possible from the data; they can learn anything there is to learn. But then, when we put the largest available model today, so GPT-3 OpenAI, one of the largest, it has 175 billion parameters. so that is a highly overparameterized model to say the least right uh, but 
uh, with that kind of an advanced model, uh, when you have conversation of the type you see on the right hand side, it is inconsistent. So I feel very bad. I want to kill myself. Is uh, the response by GPT three is helpful at first, and then you just rephrase that in a different way. Should I kill myself? And GPT three comes back with, I think you should. And the bottom example is. Uh, can wearing a mask actually reduce my chances of getting the flu? And GPT-3 responds with yes, and some more details to support the yes. You repeat the same question, and the response is flipped completely. So data-driven learning here, it's clear that is not working, right? So how can you uh, try and make sense of the responses a little more? So the goal here is not to uh, not necessarily to get the right responses all the time, but to explain to people using such systems that why is the model responding in this way so that this confusion does not happen and we don't have Jackie Chan scratching his head. So <clears throat> now, um, what exactly are language models uh, tasked with, right? What is the kind of knowledge that humans use in such uh, domains in clinical practice, for example? that the language model is supposed to be expected to learn automatically from data. So here are some examples of it. Um, for a human, when they're presented with texts like really struggling with my bisexuality and so on, uh, when they're parsing this piece of text, they're thinking of all these objects uh, that you see on the screen. After they find that the uh, text is connected to all these objects, they tie it to their definition of obsessive compulsive disorder, which is found in a medical text such as the DSM-5. Once they tie it to this definition, they're able to definitively or somewhat definitively say that this text must be related to obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So if a machine learning system could construct an explanation like this, then it would be super useful to a human being using this system. Uh, the right hand side of it is a similar uh, case where you have a string and all that uh, string has actually is different ways in which the, the drug buprenorphine is used. Bup is the slang name. And then there is a very domain specific uh, attribute to bup, like route of administration is a string that only makes sense if you think of drug abuse. Uh, and then there is sentiments here that makes sense in the general natural language processing context. There is dosage, which only makes sense in the context of any drug. So there is all these varying contexts uh, playing here. And also you have to identify those varying contexts and all of the annotations that you see on the text box. So the language model is expected to learn all this just from data and using 175 billion parameters. So by now, hopefully, it's, uh, it does uh, kind of seem like you would need to do more than just increase the number of parameters, but actually have mechanisms to incorporate knowledge like this into the language model. Um, but let's say in an ideal world, uh, somehow we have created the perfect language model that can learn everything from data. And it comes back to us with an answer like, okay, this text is obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm sure 99.9%. .9%, and it gets that right approximately 100% of the times. Still, even if that were the case, an expert uh, uh, cannot trust this model without understanding its reasoning behavior. Right? This we have verified with the clinical partners that we work with here at the Institute. No matter how good it gets with its accuracy, that number means nothing to them until they can get an explanation for its reason. Right? So, <clears throat> OK. With that motivation, I'll start expounding on the meaning of neurosymbolic AI bit by bit. So first, we'll start with symbolic reasoning. So symbolic reasoning, which is the first part of AI, uh, first uh, way that AI was crafted. Um, is basically you create explicit symbols for parts of your problem that you're interested in. So if you want to answer a question like, uh, who is the current president or who came after Trump, right? To disambiguate uh, who came after Trump, because that there, there's quite a few ways you could uh, uh, think of that question. The symbol came after is found in a particular uh, symbol knowledge base and then 
it is replaced with that symbol. So the symbol came after is replaced with succeeded by, for instance, in this case. And then succeeded by is found in the concept net knowledge graph. And so when you see succeeded by in the concept net knowledge graph, you expect two arguments to that. One is former president and the right side argument is the current president. And so former president is replaced by the symbol Trump. And then the current president you can find from Wikipedia as Joe Biden. So this is an example of purely symbolic reasoning. You have a rule base, which is uh, uh, specifying how do you find the current president and you instantiate that rule base by finding who the former president is, how do you interpret came after and so on. Right. <clears throat> now, as you can see that this kind of symbolic reasoning is completely interpretable to an expert uh, using this system or a human using this system, expert or not. Now, we come to what is uh, deep learning. Uh, so deep learning in general, let's uh, call it statistical learning. Uh, what that does for us right now is uses knowledge of the type that you saw earlier, like former president precedes um, the current president. That's, that's knowledge that humans have uh, and converts it into a vector space. The reason for doing that is because the current statistical learning algorithms, the current state of the art, they operate on vector spaces. So the symbolic knowledge that you had, like in the previous slide, has to be also converted to the uh, some representation in vector space for use with these statistical learning methods. So once you do that, you do enhance your pile that we showed in the first comic by inserting knowledge somewhere there. But it's still unclear exactly where knowledge ended up in that pile, right? <clears throat> So we want to use external knowledge and the transparent reasoning that is available in symbolic reasoning. So uh, that brings us to knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI. So knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI uh, is where you take the low level data, uh, which is sensory information, text information, image, whatever that may be from measurements that you get from your devices. You pass that through statistical learning methods and you use your symbolic knowledge and pass that through a different module that constru that constructs uh, the symbolic knowledge in such a way that it's machine readable and efficient. For example, a knowledge graph. So, uh, so other options could be rules. It could be uh, context-free grammars and so on. But those, uh, it has been found uh, and proven that knowledge graphs are more efficient for querying and uh, symbolic reasoning than the other rule bases and databases, for instance. Um, so that's why knowledge graph, for example, is the standard in web-based search. Uh, so the high level knowledge can be constructed using a knowledge graph. The low level knowledge is passed into a statistical algorithm and the two interact with each other to provide a symbolic uh, b uh, reasoning based uh, approach to uh, arrive at the decisions that the system takes. And this way we combine the best of both worlds automated pattern learning by the statistical learning algorithm as well as transparent reasoning by the symbolic reasoning module so i'll show some examples of that before that let's define what neurosymbolic ai is so performing tasks uh, that use symbolic reasoning by leveraging neurally learned data patterns to ground symbols so the features of neurosymbolic AI is that it is highly interpretable and generalizable across related domains. Knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI is that symbolic reasoning is just specifying the use of symbols so that you can uh, clearly explain the reason. But it doesn't say if those symbols are the ones that are interesting to humans. So knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI is ensuring that human expectations of correctness in both the reasoning, the way the reasoning happens, which graph paths are traversed, for example, to arrive at a decision, and the concepts, which graph nodes are modeled, do they meet human expectations, the humans that will actually end up using these systems? So <clears throat> here is an example uh, of a system that we are currently building at the Institute. It is uh, to form analogy uh, between concepts from somebody's personal uh, life experience to something they're trying to learn. So, for example, 
if you're trying to teach the concept of cyber security to someone who doesn't know about it uh, you you take two pieces of text like you see here and then uh, you I start identifying symbols in both of those pieces of text now the underlined symbols why are they underlined you could have identified any uh, subtext in those texts as interesting symbols so why did we identify just the ones that are underlined that is where the knowledge comes in so the knowledge allows us to choose the symbols that are uh, of useful um, analogical meaning to the human using this system for example in their personal life domain they can uh relate stealing an valuable item in their home household to stealing sensitive information in the cyber security domain right <clears throat> um this is a second example where uh you see a post on reddit so if we look at this c part of the diagram and each post has is composed of multiple sentences for each sentence you get a, a annotation which is that is the sentence talking about one of three concepts the concepts are does this person uh, wish to be dead uh, the second concept is are they having non specific active suicidal thoughts and the third concept is that they're having active active suicidal ideation with a plan and intent to act so that's the annotation that we have with us this is annotation obtained from medical experts um so um, uh, the difference between neuro symbolic ai and knowledge infused neuro symbolic ai here would be that uh, for those sentences the annotations could be anything like waking up any more could be an annotation like uh, this is a sleep concept uh honest didn't wake up honestly could be an annotation corresponding to not being honest as a but why did we pick specifically concepts 1 2 and 3 as interesting annotations on these sentences because that's what makes meaningful sense for this use case and you get that from knowledge that allows us to do a task such as uh, staging an intervention so when you identify in this text concept c1 and c2 and you do nothing about it it can advance to concept c3 this person can be at risk of harming themselves so you know another example here uh, we are looking at cardiovascular disease risk depending on gender so this is not an orthodox problem you have to identify the right set of overlapping concepts between factors that affect cardiovascular health of an individual and factors that uh, the gender uh, specifically causes that affect the cardiovascular health of an individual and these are distinctly different for men and women uh, th this is supported by medical research so uh, this is a, a complicated pr problem for just neuro symbolic ai because as you can see in that vocabulary on the left hand side there's a whole bunch of things that can be identified and those things can be identified only if you have external medical knowledge sources to draw from otherwise it's unclear exactly what you should identify in the data okay this is a last example to drive home the concept which is if you have a query so this is the an example that is canonical computer science so search web search you have a query economy and employment statistics the user also gives some a little bit of descriptions think of that as a google search you're typing on on google so with that uh, you may have noticed that um so so with that uh, you may have noticed that google comes back with questions like people also ask uh so that's a use case here how does it know what else people ask from this vague uh, title and description right so first uh, the title and description is enhanced using graphical knowledge from existing knowledge sources and then related terms in those graphs are questioned about so uh, that is how google knows that this query can be expanded to ask more related questions of the type that you see in that seeking more information box okay so the first focus of the tutorial is that what are the tasks that require knowledge 
and how do we obtain the data what does the data look like so once again i'll reiterate through the same tasks same set of tasks with a focus on discussing the task at hand and what kind of data we have so here an example of a task in our data set is uh, the question is the trojan horse dangerous to my computer now if you uh, examine the text on both sides there is no line explicitly saying trojan horse is harmful to your computer so this answer is not easy to get from just the text the raw data so <clears throat> that's why this task requires external knowledge to uh, give an answer to this question so once you construct a knowledge out uh, meaningful knowledge out of it like you see in the graph representations of the two only then can you connect the dots by saying that stealing sensitive information is similar to stealing valuable items and then you would have a rule in the back end that fires saying that that's a bad thing that is denoted by a red box so then you know that a trojan horse can cause that bad thing and only once you know all of that information can you answer the question affirmatively that trojan horse is indeed dangerous to your computer so this is extremely challenging for a data purely data driven system because in that text nowhere is it explicitly mentioned that a trojan horse is dangerous to your computer right <coughs> now uh, this is another uh, example for analogical mapping which is uh, maybe a little more involved but I'll, I'll try my best to explain it so what you see on the left hand side is how energy is created in the body through a process called oxidative phosphorylation so exactly what happens there is electrons are transported on an electron transport chain and that uh, transfer causes energy to be created because of the movement kinetic energy and then protons use that energy to uh, um, move uh, to to create force to move the protons and then that creates a conversion of uh, the units uh, required by the body um, into adenosine triphosphate which is finally the energy so uh, that process is almost literally analogically related to just a villager pulling uh, water in a pulley out of a well so it's exactly the same concept the rope is the electron transport chain and then the height difference between the bottom of the well and the top at at the level at which the villager is pulling the rope uh, creates a potential difference like a proton gradient and then that is converted into the energy that the villager uses to lift the bucket so it's not at all clear without forming this graphical analogy to a lay person that there would be any relationship between these two things so for a purely data driven system to do this would be uh, pretty hard <clears throat> um, okay so coming to the suicidality example the task is context identification it is a particular post exhibiting uh, a particular kind of suicidal behavior right so if let's say these annotations were not present concept 1 2 3 and uh, this tree which is knowledge present in the cssr cssrs is a columbia suicide severity rating scale let's say all that knowledge we did not have and we had just the raw data which is the text how is it easy for us to answer the task which is is post x2 exhibiting suicidal behavior or attempt it is not really uh, that straightforward to do it from the raw data it may be possible but it's not uh, clear how it would be possible because that user could express these concepts in a variety of different ways that they wish to be dead or that they're having active suicidal thoughts there's just almost infinite ways in the english language to express those things so to rely on a pure uh, least statistical uh, technique that relies on data patterns text patterns to try and somehow decipher that these concepts exist uh, and then arrive at a conclusion that this person is showing suicidal behavior or attempt is, is is a pretty herculean task for the statistical learning method on its own so if you had an intermediate layer that lifts the text to high level concepts and not only does that but lifts the text to concepts that matter to an expert that is working in this domain 
uh, it is much easier for a system to use those uh, to construct a function from those concepts that uh, determine behavior attempt being exhibited by this user. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. So the uh, cardiovascular disease case for uh, depending on gender, if they're male or female, if you look at the Reddit post on its own, it's not clear that being female or attributes of being female, like a male can be pregnant, um, has anything to do with cardiovascular disease at all. Right. So identifying those concepts, what are the concepts related to being a particular gender? And what are the concepts uh, re, uh, that can affect somebody's cardiovascular health, like anxiety or them having PTSD or them having fatigue, right? These require very elaborate knowledge to even understand for a human being. So an AI system, without this knowledge being explicitly fed into it, it's unclear how its parameters would automatically learn all this knowledge from just the textual data. Because to the AI system, the textual data is a bunch of strings. And those strings have no inherent meaning to them, except that there is some surrounding strings to each string that gives it some meaning, but that's about it. So, but really what that string means in a medical context, not only in, in one medical context, but in across several medical contexts, like mental health context, you see here anxiety and PTSD, you see tiredness context, which is fatigue, and you see a entirely different uh, context, which is gender. All those things are just not clear to the machine learning system based on just the string being exempt. <clears throat> Okay, in, in uh, information seeking, which is again the Google search example, just from the query, uh, this this is a case where it becomes is is really clear that the data alone is not enough to ask anything more about. So if you just had the title and description, then how do you know what to ask that user to clarify exactly what do they want from their Google search, right? So. Here, a query expansion is almost a necessity. You can't really understand what the user wants without some form of query expansion. And how do you get that query expansion? You get it from an external knowledge source. So you use the terms in the query and you find related terms to it and you ask questions related to that related terms, to those related terms, so that you can understand better what the user is trying to search for. And once you understand those related terms, you can uh, pull external information from sources such as Wikipedia to further enhance the kind of questions you want to ask the user to better understand their query. OK, so now coming to the nuts and bolts of the AI system, which is that uh, we understand now that you need to convert the raw data to symbolic representations like graphs and um, interoperate between the two. Uh, but how do you do that exactly? And what does that look like? So yeah, let's take the mental health example. So for a particular post, uh, each sentence is annotated with um, concepts related to suicide or depression. Uh, so what you see here is uh, uh, what we saw earlier, the suicide concept, concepts are one to three, wish to be dead and so on. And what uh, new is introduced in this slide is there are also nine um, depression concepts. They come from a different uh, knowledge source related to depression. All these things are present in medical knowledge bases. <clears throat> so you have that kind of data. So that is mapped to uh, graph instances that you see on the right hand side. And then the schema is retained as it is. So what do I mean by the schema? The fact that this data contains the type of information that a particular sentence is related to a particular type of concept that is present in the um, database, that is what the schema specifies. So for example, the two kinds of schema here is sentence related to suicide concept and sentence related to depression concepts. That is the only type of data you'll see in this data set. That's what the schema specifies. So you take the instances of that schema, which is present in the data set, and convert them to graph instances. 
and then you can use a sentence encoder to go from those graph in instances to distributed vector representations. You can't use a sentence encoder to encode the schema, so you retain the schema as it is. Uh, what does retaining the schema as it is give you? Once you do uh, some machine learning on the sentence encoded representations of the graph instances, you can verify using the schema if it has learned what you intended for it to learn. Um, a similar process happens with the uh, cardiovascular disease case for gender. For every post, you uh, use a gender encoder to convert it into a representation that is um, related to gender. And then for every post, you also convert it using a separate module to a representation that is related to cardiovascular disease or medical terms in general. Uh, okay, in, in the uh, information seeking case, uh, the knowledge that is used to um, get more information about the user query does not actually have a schema. So in this case, you just uh, skip the schema retention step and you just uh, convert the uh, raw data into graphical format and then project it into vector space. So here you can see which terms in that vector space are close to each other and which terms are farther away. And that gives you an idea of uh, which questions should be related. So if a question you see about gross domestic product and a question about gross national product should closely follow it. That's what that vector space suggests. Uh, so now we'll now that we've seen how to go from raw data to graph uh, representations, uh, uh, we'll see how that is used by the method. So for the suicide identification case, the details of uh, the math behind this, I will um, say that we can look at the paper to understand better, but just briefly what this equation is saying is that it's just basically re representing the tree on the left hand side in algebraic form so for example uh, this tree you can think of as a sum of four paths so that's this outer sum and then the leaf at each of those paths has a particular ground truth probability from your training data that's this py and then there's three concepts and the inner sum is basically saying that uh, for every uh, post, if any sentence, so x sub means that x is the post first, and then x sub means that any sub part of the post, if it matches the qi, qi is these concepts c1, c2, c3. So if there is any function that says that any sub part of the post is identified as being related to any concept c1 to c3, then the whole post is identified as being related to the concept. So the summation greater than or equal to 0 0.5 represent a, represents a, the algebraic form of a disjunction. So again, to repeat that, the inner sum is essentially saying that if any sub part of the post is related to any concept, then the whole post is related to the concept. It's an OR condition. And then uh, the outer sum says that outer sum is specifying the or conditions for each of the leaves that you see in the tree. Um, so that is our probability model. <clears throat> the loss function is a general uh, Bernoulli loss, like in uh, any binary outcome case. And what do you get from that is, uh, I'll show a demo of this later, but you can see, for example, that you enter some text uh, uh, through a color coding scheme, you can identify which concepts are present in the text. And you can get the inference uh, based on the concepts present in the text and an explanation for that inference from the tree. So the, uh, the AI features of this, by, by AI features, I mean, uh, what is a con computer science contribution is contrasting this kind of a formulation with say something like OpenAI's GPT-3, the number of parameters here to learn is just the theta i, which is a one theta i for every question present in this tree. So literally four in this case versus 175 billion. So you can enumerate the number of thetas in this situation and get a global optimum. 
but even if you didn't want to enumerate the algebraic form of this uh, equation is strongly convex which means that any gradient based technique will reach the global optimum fairly quickly uh, and then the third one is what the user cares about the most that using a formulation like this you can explain to the user why has this system arrived at this decision okay <clears throat> For the um, <clears throat> cardiovascular disease case, this is uh, uh, an architecture that was developed by Usha um, and others at the AI Institute, where you encode the text through different modules um, specific to gender and specific to cardiovascular disease. And then you combine those two representation, uh, th those two encodings to understand if they occur together if the gender context and the uh, disease context occur together so <clears throat> the last thing is um, an architecture that uh, constructs a graph out of the data like the one you see here uh, so those two sentences in post x1 are related to each other through concept c1 in the context of ideation one uh, the two sentences in post X2 are related to each other th through all three concepts and they happen in the, uh, the context of behavior or attempt. So using that information uh, to modify the math uh, mathematics behind a transformer architecture, uh, you get the following. So basically you're saying that uh, there's a penalty uh, term added to the um, uh, softmax input which is to say that the D in the denominator is uh, measuring graphical distance. So if for two sentences, you have the graphical distance being small, then uh, the top part, which is the representation that comes out of this model, if they're far apart, then the penalty is high. So basically the representational distance should agree with the graphical distance in this model through this bias term then that penalty is low. If the representational distance is far apart while the graphical distance is low, then the numerator blows up and the penalty is high. So um, features of this kind of architecture is that it enforces graph topology at a concept level that is meaningful to the end user. And then um, you also see in this architecture modification of the kind that there is a alpha and one minus alpha parameter. So that gives, examining that alpha can give you clear uh, indication as to where the data was playing a part, data patterns were playing a part in the prediction and where the external knowledge infuse was playing a part in the prediction. And then uh, the green edges sh show that uh, for those posts, the graph distance was low and the red edges show that for those posts, the data pattern distance was low. So by data pattern distance here, it is measured by uh, Euclidean distance. OK. So with that, once again, uh, I am hoping that these definitions are clear to you. What do you achieve by purely neurosymbolic AI? Uh, you get raw data you learn data patterns from the uh, raw data using some neural network learning technique or in general statistical learning technique. And then you convert those patterns into symbols and do symbolic reasoning over those symbols so that the reasoning is transparent. That is neurosymbolic AI. Now in knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI, you do the same set of procedures, which is to repeat again from raw data, learn patterns from the data using a neural network learning technique convert those patterns into symbols, but this time you convert them into symbols with the aid of external knowledge uh, so as to ensure that those symbols are meaningful to the end user of the system, humans that will use that system. Then do symbolic reasoning consistent with uh, reasoning patterns that make sense to the end users of the system. For As an example that we saw earlier that uh, you could do any kind of reasoning with the concepts identified in a suicide case, like wish to be dead and so on. But we did specifically this, uh, this three type of reasoning on this left-hand side, because that is the type of reasoning that people do in clinical practice uh, to identify suicidal patterns.
Okay, with that, I'll uh, show a code demo. So here um, I'm showing you the CSSR concepts first. Yeah, so you see there, there are five concepts. Uh, sorry, I did something wrong. Yeah, these five concepts. Okay, now uh, in another file, uh, they stored the rules. So that decision tree that you saw that is stored as this list structure uh, in the back end of the program. So if concepts, none of the concepts are written. Okay, Kaushik, one moment. Can you just pause for two minutes? We are just uh, changing something on the audio here because people are having problems. Just give us a minute. Okay. Kaushik, can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? No, we're still having audio issues. Hold on. Bus, can you do this during the tea break? Huh? I'm sorry. This is not OK. Yeah. Just, just pull it out. Just pull it out. And pull that other thing also out. You can't hear when he speaks if that is plugged in. This is not the time to experiment. No, but we had already connected in that. 
network that was already ready and working. It's not working now. No, it's there. I'm connecting them. I'm going to do that. 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 Toshit, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Can you? You can go ahead. Okay. I'll, uh, no problem. Um, so I'm uh, playing the demo that shows um, an example of what that uh, what the pro uh, program uh, output looks. I'll, I'll go ahead and play. First, we look at the um, SSR's concept one to five. So we see that the first concept is wish to be dead, the second concept is non specific active suicidal thoughts, the third one is active ideation with any method, the fourth is active ideation with an intent to act. And the fifth one is active ideation with a specific plan and intent to it. So we would like to annotate the data with these concepts. And after annotation with those concepts, we would like to use the rules present in the annotation guidelines to infer the suicidality context for that particular point. So this is in the program how the tree is, is coded. So we have, if none of the three paths are satisfied, then the context is in or none. If the first concept is satisfied, the context is ideation type one. If the first and second concept is satisfied, the, uh, the context is ideation type two. And if all of the variables are satisfied, then the context is suicidal behavior. So let's look here with an example. So, we're going to start the interpreter import the pro new class. Uh, create an object. Import the process knowledge that you guys just saw. and the rules to infer once the concepts are identified. We are now, we're going to enter a test point. So I'll enter test point with five sentences. Now we're going to evaluate this test point using the process knowledge object we just created. And 
And if uh, there's a flag for explanation, which I'm going to set to true, if that was false, then it would just return the inference label. But we are interested in the explanation. So we can see what you're typing on the screen. The font is too small. Perhaps it's a little bit. Yeah, make that full screen, maybe. Um, Which one? Let me. Can you see it now? This is a little better. Okay. okay. So, I, um, yeah, so I, I'll stop the video here. But basically, what the demo is showing is that for any text you we can enter any text here this program is available um it will show you which concepts are present in the text and here you can use the tree to understand the inference so for example here the red concept is present which is concept one and the green concept is present which is concept two so the third uh tree path, which is concept one and two is present, leads to ideation. So that's how you understand that the inference is ideation. And the idea, so why is this knowledge infused neurosymbolic AI? Uh, because once again, starting with the data, which is this text, you first uh, understand patterns that lift the data to symbolic level. So the there is a neural network at the back end that understands that I feel backed into a corner is concept one. So that's the lifting to the symbol part. Now, if a knowledge was not there, it could just lift a corner into a symbol that is unrelated to any medical terminology. For example, corner, it could lift to uh, a symbol called edge. It could lift... Um, uh, people realize there can be humor in everything to a concept called happy, right? Now, those things are not medically relevant terminology. So the neural network needs to lift these uh, textual patterns into concepts that are medical terminology. So that is where the knowledge infusion comes in. Now, uh, the medical terminology, once you have identified, those become your symbols and you do symbolic reasoning over those which is this tree. The, the Parsing this tree is uh, one type of symbolic reasoning, and you get inference. So that is the different parts of the neurosymbolic knowledge-infused learning, knowledge-infused neurosymbolic AI, sorry. So all of those components uh, are required to solve a real-world problem like this. So yeah, so that is the demo. I can enter more points later if we have time. I, I uh, uh, on the on my computer I can fire this program up and enter other points if you guys want to see it, but for now I'll transition to uh, Manas who will uh, who will go into more detail about how we construct these data sets and methods. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Before we go to Manas, uh, uh, I just wanted to check Kaushik, do you want to take questions now or later? I can take questions now on so what has been discussed so far. Any, any questions? So I have a question. Uh, so I think uh, one of the things that uh, comes to my mind here is that when you talk about explicit knowledge, uh, some of the knowledge can be sort of more correlation than confirmed knowledge, right? So you you don't uh, say that, uh, uh, just as an example, you don't say A causes B, you would say that A is correlated with B, uh, mm -hmm. high probability. And uh, the equation that you showed us would take care of these kinds of correlations uh, rather than causations, is it? <coughs> So the uh, equation that uh, I showed you is, uh, you're talking about the algebraic form of the tree, is that, is that right? Yeah, so the tree is by uh, definition a, a subset of a directed acyclic graph. So 
uh, if the concepts that are the decision variables in the tree completely cover the domain, then it uh, what the tree is essentially saying is that the root has to happen first, and then the leaves have to happen, and then the leaves of the leaf, I mean the descendants have to happen, and then the descendants of the descendants have to happen, and so on. So it is specifying a causal direction. But now it's not that clear cut that that is the whole causal picture because there could be confounders and other things. Yeah. Here it is generally accepted that that is uh, reasonably causal in direction because that is the textbook uh, knowledge. So if a clinician is saying those are the causal patterns that they look for to identify suicidality, humans do make mistakes, but that's the best we can uh, hope to achieve for now with uh, establishing causality in our inference for the domains such as these medical domains. Uh, I, does that answer the question? Yeah, so, you know, especially in medicine, very often you will not get explicit causality, right? Even in page four. Yeah. You right. will only get correlations. And how would you cater to something like that? So, uh, uh, if I want to pitch in uh, in the middle, um, Kaushik, do you have a do you have a response for it? Yeah. So, okay. My response for that for that is that uh, I agree that so medical uh, even uh, in practice, the way medical uh, science works, as far as I understand it, is you hypothesize that through a control group and a non-control group that some uh, treatment technique works. And before the hypothesis testing results in significantly improved uh, p-value for the uh, hypothesis over the null hypothesis, the uh, chance that the treatment is working for the control group is treated as purely correlational. But if there is statistical significance in the improvement, then uh, one might think of the treatment as causing a beneficial outcome in the patients, but still there can be confounders. So the very nature of how medical science is carried out, as far as I understand it, means that what you're saying will happen even if we use textbook medical knowledge. But I will say that as far as establishing uh, acceptable causal patterns are concerned, uh, when we are deploying these systems for real world use cases such as mental health, uh, at least sticking to the expert definition of uh, causality, which is, uh, again, in, in the mathematical sense, maybe not completely causal, um, is better than doing purely correlational pattern matching from raw data. Yeah, is that... Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I agree with your point. Uh, what I'm, what I'm, uh, uh, echo, echo back end. Okay. So actually, the the, the direction that I'm, uh, I'm mo motivating myself in terms of causality and correlation uh, behavior in AI is when we are dealing with medical information. Certainly, not all the information in a knowledge structure. Let's say I talk about ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases, right? Uh, that that kind of so if I look at ICD-10, it is generally used for for billing purposes. We all know that it's using for 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 it has been looked for for billing of uh, 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 billing the patients with uh, which are based on the severity of the disease that the patient has. But intrinsically, if you look at ICD-10, right, it's kind of a hierarchy. And hierarchy goes deep in the details. So that means if I go down in the hierarchy of ICD-10, all the, 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 the root nodes of ICD-10 would be a very specific disease. And they are related, causally related to the disease on the top. There's another example. If, if ICD-10 is one, one example, another example would be, would be a questionnaire. When, when you are having a clinical interviews, Right, a uh, 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 doctor or a clinician would not ask a random question to you, but rather it has a more structured format of questions where it relates with some uh, symptoms going into some kind of a, like a peripheral information that would relate with the symptoms, then defining as a causal behavior that this might be 
the, the, the potential cause of this uh, uh, disease that the person is sharing or if I is describing and then relating it with a treatment. So this so this causality that you that you see over here is uh, is not something that is available in all sorts of knowledge, but it is available in some sort of knowledge which has been defined by experts. So I would say that in medical domain, there are certain set of resources that have been defined in a causal in a causal situation, in a causal manner. For instance, the movement of a disease, a movement of a patient from one doctor to another doctor, where he switches patients. When the when the uh, when a patient switches the clinician is a causal behavior. Uh, when when we look at the patients increasing his moving from one severity level to another severity level is another example of causal behavior. For example, he's moving from depression to suicidal suicidality or suicidal tendencies is a causal behavior. And the the way you can assess this is basically the, how you can relate the connections between the questions. That are being assessing the depression and the questions that are assessing the the suicide uh, the suicidal behavior. So if you look at these two as an independent pieces, you will consider them as a correlation. But if you stitch them together, then you will be able to figure out that they are causal uh, associations between them. So the idea that we are thinking is that if you look at the content from the perspective of depression first, and then define the behavior towards the suicidality, we might establish a causal behavior. But that still is like is something that we are still working on. But the direction that we are heading is we are looking at the resources in the medical domain, which are inherently, which are inherently causal. Thank you. Thank you, Manas. Uh, any other questions in the room? Uh, so I have two generic questions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, in NSCI, how, uh, how do you feel, uh, how much it is dependent on, or how much uh, deconfounded learning? See, in, in this medical domain, that deconfounded learning is very important because you have a uh, kind of skill distribution and there is confounding variables are anywhere, everywhere. So, do you feel that NSCI somehow helps deconfounded learning? Uh, I we are not able to get the uh, question correctly. Uh, can the speaker come closer to the mic or something? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah so uh, my question is like that: NSCI uh, has some kind of expert knowledge in there because we have to put some symbolic interpretation and symbolic knowledge towards the learning process. Mm -hmm. So in medical uh, screening, or if you want to do some kind of automated screening. So um, there may be uh, scenarios where confounding variables are present. So mm -hmm. in presence of uh, deconfounded learning, so if you want to do deconfounded learning, so how much do you feel NSI will help? So uh, I will, I'll try to unpack that question. So uh, in NSI uh, on its own um, is uh, symbolic reasoning. Now, symbolic reasoning does not uh, on its own solve the issue of confounding variables because uh, whether we do symbolic reasoning, neurosymbolic reasoning, or whether we do statistical pattern matching, we, we still have to model the factors that can affect the outcome. And if the factors that affect the outcome are not fully observed, which means that there are confounding factors, uh, it, it, it is in th that issue is independent of uh, the technique we use, which is statistical uh, learning to determine the outcome or neurosymbolic learning to determine the outcome. Because in that case, to isolate the effects of confounding factors, we have to do other things like uh, test specifically for the values that that uh, uh, that confounding factor may take and how its exact influences on the factors that we do observe. And then uh, once we do that, once we modify the uh, val values of the factors that we do observe based on our hypothesis of the confounding factor variables assignments, uh, we can then proceed to deciding whether neurosymbolic AI would be more suitable to uh, determine the outcome or statistical learning. But on its own, neurosymbolic AI or statistical learning, the question of using either of the two, I, I believe does not uh, address uh, the issue of how do we tackle confounding factors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so just related question. So, uh, in typically deconfounded learning is a kind of People solve with uh, do, do calculus. Mm -hmm. So, mm, but in do calculus, we need some counterfactual, some interventions and all. So, but NSI, what I felt that there is a mm, chances of, you know, avoiding do calculus because do calculus has some kind of assumptions. And if you have some kind of expert knowledge and if you build NSI with expert knowledge, uh, that kind of assumptions we can just, uh, you know, strong assumptions will be there that we can avoid. And maybe uh, deconfounded learning might be better with NSA. Yes. So that's my yes. own point. Yes, yes, I, I agree. agree with you. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll just uh, quickly touch on that. Yeah, that is, I 100% I agree with that. So when we are using external knowledge to drive the neurosymbolic AI, uh, so let's say knowledge is coming from Wikipedia. So because so many people edit to Wikipedia, uh, there is some kind of ontological commitment. So the relationships that you observe in Wikipedia, you might treat as the truth uh, with a quotation marks around it, but at least more truthful than other sources because so many people have agreed that that's, that is the information they want publicly presented to the internet and the world. So do calculus can be circumvented in that case when at least we are using a relationship that we see in Wikipedia because we don't have to necessarily test rigorously for that relationship to be true or false and we can roughly trust that a lot of humans uh, validating that relationship means that there must be reasonably causal uh, association between the participants in that relationship yeah, thank you. so uh, are there any questions? Okay, so Manas, I'm going to propose that we take a tea break now because actually tea break is supposed to be in five minutes from now. It okay. Sense for you to get started and then we take a break. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll probably take a tea break for 20 25 minutes and be back here, let's say uh, 11.50, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. sure. Okay. So 11.50 uh, India time, Manas. Okay. All right. And uh, thank you so much, Kaushik, for your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So start sharing your screen. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. Is it visible? Is the screen visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, okay. So I think uh, everyone is back from the little break. Uh, so in the remaining part of the tutorial, uh, I, okay. If I, in the remaining part of the tutorial, I would be focusing on uh, the points that uh, my, the previous tutor Kaushik left out uh, where we, where, where, where we are like looking into the concept of neurosymbolic AI uh, in the setting of conversational systems. Like, uh, so we have been talking about, and we are all aware of Amazon Alexa, we are aware of Google Assistant, we are aware of uh, Apple Siri, and most importantly, if I would suggest, if, uh, if, uh, if I would ask the audience that what would be the most important uh, or a pressing question they would ask these agents is the following, what's the time right now? Siri, can you tell me the time right now? Siri, can you tell me the weather outside? Uh, Siri, can, can you suggest me any uh, good restaurants near me? Or is, the, is, there a is, a, is there a restaurant serving Mexican food near me? 
so all these questions are the questions where we are interacting with the agents and this is just one question that happens and the interactions just wither off and there's no mother no further uh, interaction that takes place uh, with the agent or the agent doesn't does not even try interacting with the user in in coming up with a more uh, engaging conversations maybe if i ask the agent let's can you suggest me a low calorie food in lunch right so among the various options of low calorie food that are existing the agent should be asking you which low calorie food do you want to choose here are the options that i have so here the you agent is not only asking you a question but also giving you a series of information as well that is relevant so these this this kind of behavior in the agent is what i term as or what i call is as is what i call is call is curiosity and this curiosity is something very interesting and it has and it can in, enhance the way agent converse in in our day to day lives and how to how they can be more friendly and more uh, relatable to our queries than simply just asking about what's the weather outside that sounds that sounds a good question and seems and a good response can also follow it if the agent ask you the weather the uh, the weather outside looks rainy and probably you need to keep a a, a rain jacket or you want to keep keep a small umbrella with you so that seems a more contextualized set of response but that's where we are heading with the in the domain of conversational information seeking and that's where the deep dive is but the most important application of conversational information seeking that i thought of was to minimize the number of turns that a agent needs to make with the user let's take these two examples and these two examples are pretty broad talking about in a very generic domains we are not talking about mental health right now we are talking about in the generic domains and the generic domain the question is that i need to learn about blockchain and cryptocurrencies now as we know that the words in a in a deep language model or in a in a uh, in a current uh, uh, transformer based language model which is current the state of the art and even i use as a baseline uh, what they are trying to do is that they they are learning based on word co occurrences they are they are trained on a huge large uh, language corpora where they are trying to associate the words co occurrences the, the the association between these words right if i use this uh, these word these models as it is what i would get is that as you can see on the on the top that if i ask this query to the agent agent wants to ask me the query back do you want to know about blockchain it is just a uh, reaffirming uh, it is just confirming your your query and then it ask you do you want to know about cryptocurrency and you say yes and then it ask you do you want to know blockchain and currencies and you say no and of this question the third question itself is is wrong such a question should not be generated you know in a as far as like what human would would think so in this multi turn conversations the the biggest disadvantage is the loosening of this context this context the connection between blockchain and currencies came out because somewhere of the responses that the model was generating for previous two questions it end up finding some connection between currencies and blockchain and and ended up asking a new question saying that do you want to know about blockchain and currencies whereas if a, this similar agent is trained in a in a in a conversational information seeking fashion where what i propose uh, or what i proposed was that rather than doing a multi turn conversation the agent is able to gather a series of questions which might be kind of like a more informative uh, or information seeking for the user that are being generated by the agent and and if i have yes and no responses are being gathered for these questions a more cohesive response can be given out in one single shot and but the question is how do we build such a system right and one interesting use case of such a system is that if if a, such a system can, can 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 generate such a long series of questions it need some kind of a context that context cannot occur in a, in a knowledge cannot occur in a in a, a series of passages or wikipedia or, or or any kind of like news forums or news reports it occurs in a form of a knowledge graph because the the terms are connected in in, in a knowledge graph it can be connected in a, in a common sense knowledge graph it can be a part of a dbpedia as well 
right so in this case if you can see we are talking about the term ethereum and bitcoin to be the siblings of each other and they are connected with some concept like invented and facts probably a question can be uh, that uh, agent might ask do you want to know who invented ethereum so this is a kind of a fascinating question because agent the user did not ask about ethereum probably he would be asking but since he's asking about blockchain and cryptocurrencies maybe these questions are very much relevant to relevant to him so rather than doing a multi-turn setting we want to see that if the agent can build up with a curiosity factor that it can generate those questions straightforward in the single shot and single response can be uh, I, agent can simply say that I, I want an answer to all of them and the agent can get a more cohesive response against these questions so there is a very uh, a nice application to this setting where we are looking at we are removing the redundancies in the questions and we are also in, uh, introducing the diversity of the questions but there is a lot more bigger factor to such a conversation information seeking systems let's look into this example in a much more detail so i'm just giving you a, a, another view of the similar setting uh, uh, in a in a, uh, in a generic domain before i i stitch this to a mental health setting so we have the singular simple query again we are looking at the economy and deploy, uh, employment statistics that's the title that the user has provided and he wanted to learn about information about key economic concepts about G, including gdp inflation and influence and unemployment now one uh, as you can hear out this query the first question to you is that we never have asked such a question to an any agent amazon alexa is been for years now right no one has asked this question to an amazon alexa because we sit down and we take a painstaking job of searching on the google when there are assistance for them but we don't use assistance for such queries because we know by in our, in our own feeling that they are not capable of answering these questions these queries now here's a step forward to this 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 kind of a uh, issues where we want to develop an agent that leverages some of the principles of natural language processing and together along with a uh, this knowledge graph it can enhance the capabilities of ai for generating a more nuanced series of questions that uh, whose responses from the if uh, if a user approves the, those questions a response would be a simply a co uh, an aggregation of those questions a very simple case to start with is this constituency parsing because we all know that nlp in nlp constituency parsing is very capable of identifying all the possible uh, phrases in the query or in any in the input and all the uh, phrases that were identified are relevant to the query but how they are relevant how they are stitched to each other is not what constituency passing tells us so if we pass this information through a concept and knowledge graph i used conceptnet.io the conceptnet.io uh, uh, python api to construct this graph so this construct this construction of this graph is simply a, 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 a manifestation of the connections between these phrases that you are identifying com from constituency parsing and if you look at it over here if i do single hop or a multi hop uh, uh, traversal which is fairly easy plausible in this uh, python api you can construct with this small nice illustrative uh, information which is not so illustrative on the left hand side of the constituency parsing now here you can see a lot of new information new terms coming up like you can talk to your so you see can see you can see about uh, gross national product being popping up you know you, you kind of see the personal income income tax unemployment and cost of living those terms which are kind of seem semantic related to each other but maybe user didn't say it because he would he would urge the agent should come up with his own way of thinking because he, uh, user knows that the agent is is give, is a uh, is a living example of a uh, heavy uses of internet right so if i use this to say a graph i can traverse this graph from root to top because that's how the traversal was going to be right we, we start from the root we go to the uh, we, we start from the root node we go to the uh, leaf nodes and then we traverse back to find the path now when we traverse this series of path we find different series of pa uh, passive uh, phrases being coming up income tax income cost of living inflation and connecting with economics probably we won't go into economics because that's going to be a very root node and might bring in some additional knowledge uh, additional uh, noise which we don't need so we're going to st stick at the point where we we only talk about economy inflation and employment as a as a stopping point now what we are doing is that we are looking at this information we are constructing this particular path and what we are trying to do is that we are constructing an embedding of this structure now 
embedding is some not is on is something not new is already there but now this embedding is not about the query but rather a new set of sentence that you have constructed by traversing this graph you talked about income tax is related to income income is a part of cost of living and cost of living affects in the inflation right so or cost of living is affected by inflation so those relationships are, are documented in, in 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 concept knowledge concept net graph or it's being also being part of various do documents on wikipedia as well but for now i'm just sticking to uh, only the concept net graph because that seems to be a more complete and uh, iteratively updated uh, source of knowledge now once we have this 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 series of power phrases that you have you want to retrieve the passages now that is that's very interesting rather than just blindly searching the web for the query and just taking them as an independent entities this model tries to connect these entities in a semantically related fashion so that the passages that you retrieve are relevant to the query and they are semantically relevant to the query and that's why we call it like a knowledge guided passage retriever because the, the retrieving over here is happening based on this pass based on this traversal series sequence now what's fascinating over here is that following we not only look at the we are not only get the questions that are very much ag uh, coming out from the entities being in the query but we also look at the questions that seemingly kind of uh, uh, manifest or show the the curiosity in the agent so for instance this is what is the meaning of un unemployment in, in, in inflation so this question is not a part of the question that is being in the query or in constituency parsing it came out from the knowledge graph so this kind of structure is what we want to want to uh, come up with as, when we are talking about a neuro symbolic system the here the neuro part is the same encoder part that this the bird the the same deep language model that we are talking about but we are improving the capabilities of the bird by giving it more semantically connected series of information now how do we evaluate that whether the things are right or wrong and the question that we the kaushik uh, uh the uh, kaushik started with in, in the beginning of the tutorial right so we position it as a reinforcement learning problem the reason is that whatever questions that we are having we match these questions to an expert uh, user who is looking at the system uh from uh, in the uh, during the testing phase and if the system uh, is during the training phase and if the uh, user's feedback don't fall in line with what the questions are being generated probably it has a uh, right to say yes and no to all of these questions as i said i seek only takes yes and no as a response so that means you just have to say, tell us whether you like an answer to this question or you just don't want an answer to this particular question and i seek gets back with a more cohesive response as a response to all the questions that have been marked as yes by the user so this setting has a, has a multitude uh, application so this is the, the illustration that i'm providing you is a very generic domain and now what i'm moving into would uh, what i will be moving into is uh, is its mental health counterpart but how do we come up with this particular structure let's just make it piece by piece in subsequent slides so first thing let's take about a very simple generator let's say we take we have a quick query that a person says that bothered by feeling hopeless and depressed and i need some advice i am good with my deep learning model i take the t5 which is at the time when i made it we we had that one of the most fascinating uh, model uh gpt3 could have been another op option for it but gpt3 as you know is a kind of a proprietary you have to have a connection and so on and so forth we want to we want to establish uh, a system that would that we want to we can modify and is open is publicly available so we take t5 now the generated question if you can see over here is are you feeling bothered are you feeling depressed or do you feel depressed now this seems to be a very uh, uh, uh like a, a lackluster questions because these questions do not uh make the user more curious about what uh, what the agent would be coming up with what response it would be coming with uh, coming up with now one you might be wondering why manas is talking about uh, uh question generation when response generation is what the agent is all about if you are not if the agent is not able to generate up more sensible questions 
the target, the response it will generate would be some random questions, would be a random response. And it would be like a kind of a haphazard structure. With questions, the things are more structured and have a conceptual flow. And that makes me the three points of evaluation. Does my agent capture the user context from the user query? Can the generated questions share some semantic relationship with each other? Do these questions have some logical order or not? Now, in this case, there's no logical order. Are you depressed or do you feel depressed, right? So these are two different, uh, uh, these two are different questions, but they are not, they should not be asked in this particular sequence. They should be asked like, for example, do you feel depressed and are you depressed, right? And for example, are you feeling bothered and as suddenly you go into the, are you depressed has no connection with each other. Feeling bothered and depression are two different factors. And one of the questions that, that uh, I think one person from the audience asked about the causality, this is actually a flaw of the causality. You cannot say a feeling bothered is causally related to depression. So uh, what if I improve this uh, generator network with some additional passage retriever mo model? I added some passage retriever over here because now generator is just driven by its own parametric, more uh, its own trained knowledge, which in machine learning domain, we call it tacit knowledge or learned knowledge. We kind of re reform these knowledge with some additional passage retriever. Now, when I say passive retriever, that means it's a neural model again altogether, and it is capable of retrieving and ranking the passages. Now with this, I kind of say that with this retriever, the model is able to capture the context and fair enough because we are having a passage retriever over here. But what about the other two questions? The sharing the semantic relationships and following the logical order. Now in this, when I trade this, when I train this system and put to use, these are the two weird questions that came out, came out as an outcome, which uh, what the experts are identified as but generally are these are unsafe questions because these are the questions that they won't ask. Do you feel like you are depressed sometime or do you know depression can make you mentally slow? These are like a negative questions to be asked and certainly these are questions that would you would not uh, you would not want your agent to be generating but there is no way to remove such a questions because agent is still generating questions in a random sequence. It has not following any any connection or any logical order. What, what, are, what are the next steps that we want to improve upon? Now, so far, everything is going with the reinforcement learning setting. We have a passage in a passage retriever in place. We have a generator model which is in place. So far, everything is neural model uh, driven system. What if we append to the retriever a common sense knowledge graph that I was talking about? Now, this common sense knowledge graph would only tells that will only guide this retriever on the on its passages so neural retriever by definition if i want to say is any model that given a query would give you a series of passages a ranked list of passages now these passages are related to each other by tfidf in a very simple sense now we don't want the tfidf to be governing our ordering of the passages we want the passages to be driven by the knowledge graph so the connections of the nodes in the knowledge graph is what we want to be the useful factor for ordering our passages so we define a new ranking function which ranks these passages based on the connection of the entities in the knowledge graph. That's a new function that we want to introduce apart from the standard function, which is the TFIDF metric. Now, when you do this thing, the, the, the benefit that we are having is now we have a semantic relationships in order because these semantic relationships are the way where the, these passages are connected to each other. One entity is connected to another entity. And if the, the one entity E1 and the entity E2 are in two different passages having the similar context as the query these two passages should be in the should be the close proximity of each other probably next to each other right and that's what the loss function would be in this model that we want to maximize the chance of such passages to come closer with each other right you can do the negative part of it as well but that's the whole story of uh, connecting the uh, the passages based on the common sense knowledge graph with, the, with that, you can actually have a share, you can share some semantic relationships. But what about the logical order? Now, one point that uh, one uh, I kind of, I would say, it's kind of an addressing one of the questions that uh, from the audience came, uh, came up with the causality. Now, I would not say it's exactly the causality part, but I would say the natural language inference, which is one of the uh, domain uh, within the natural language processing, is a sort of an, uh, an a proxy of causality behavior because you are trying to prove 
that whether the subsequent sentence follows a previous sentence or not. That means if the current generated question and the next generated question are related to each other, right? And they are in, they have, then they, and they have an entailment relationship. That means that they are sort of causally related. They are sort of will follow each other and they would end up having a similar a, a conceptual flow, a conceptual order. And that's what the hypothesis that I came up with. That if I want to develop, if I want to enforce a particular order in the generation, I need to develop an additional evaluator network. Now, this evaluator network is not something new. It's still a neural network, but it is being trained in a setting that, uh, uh, in a, in a, on a data set that enforce entailment probabilities. We only want to say that we want to only generate a pair of questions. Now, in the previous model so far, all these questions are generated one by one. But in this, we are looking at the pair of question generations. We are saying that we want to generate the questions to two set of, uh, or we can say a pair of questions that we want to generate in a such a setting that the current generated question entails the previous generated questions. And if it doesn't, then we won't generate that question. We only generate, we only keep to the previous question. So you are, you kind of throw a lot of uh, uh, generated questions in this model. I agree with you that this, this kind of model might take a lot of time uh, to come up with a more plausible answer, but it won't give you a generation that is unsafe. It won't give you a generation that is do not have a conceptual flow with the previous question. And it won't give you a generated question that is not related, maybe causal. I, if I, if I, if a data set in NLI is defined based on the causality behavior, it will try to adapt the causality behavior. But if it's not, then it will simply follow an entailment probability if the entailment is defined without the causality definition in it. Okay, so how does this thing uh, turns out to be in practice? So we we were talking about the so example of bothered feeling, hopelessness, depressed, and the person is needing for advice. We looked into a different setting where we say the person is saying that bothered but troubled concentrating while reading newspaper or watching television. So when we, we pass this particular query, the model was happily was finding trouble concentrating, reading newspaper and watching television to be the most probable phrases to be taken in, in a knowledge graph, right? To be searching for the knowledge graph. Now, if I look at the T5 structure, which is the, the, the deep language model, we look at this particular structure as you can see in the bottom, right? You can also glance through the questions right but the most important part is the structure of these questions if you look on the left hand side we say the questions are generated in a particular format the symptoms and symptoms and then the agent is looking for clarification right whereas the other side of the sequence is about symptoms and cause causes symptoms and moving into the diagnosis stage so the clarification open only happens when the u agent does not have a sufficient information whereas that should be the first step before it can move into the symptoms and symptoms, right? Uh, whereas a, a more definite structure is what symptoms cause, cause and symptoms and diagnosis. And this structure, right, which I'm, I'm introducing in front of you, which I'm showing you, uh, showing in front of you, is actually the structure of a, a, a symbolic system, right? This is what the symbolic systems have been built out. They have been part of uh, our, our uh, healthcare you can talk about mycin, the, the first expert system that I, tries to bring together a series of information, a sequence of information based on a bunch of rules. Now, we just wanted to those rules to be the part of the neural network system and guide its various phrases. We, we, we guide the way the passes are retrieved. We guide the way that the questions are being generated. Now, evaluated network can be a simple neural network or it can be a bunch of rules that would guide at which type of questions you want to choose and which questions you do not want to choose. And that's what I will talk about with another section, which we call it as an explainable data, right? That's where we want to talk about so while I'm with, while I will be diving you through the explainable data creation. I will be also highlighting this particular problem that this network can also be replaced by other sources as long as your data set is governed in a or is defined in a set of way that this evaluated network maybe is not needed because your your data set is is uh, well equipped in a particular structure i'm talking about right now in a very generic sense these questions as you can see are just random queries 
and you have this uh, set of uh, uh, questions being generated and these questions are generated by the agent and they do not follow any guidelines they do not follow, follow any medical practice right so they just tries to the model just tries to say which question i should pick which question i should just throw away that's the whole task of the evaluator network right and the generator network says that to the evaluator i will give you a lot of questions to using the beam search algorithm which is a very old and famous algorithm and the evaluator network will say that among the beam search operations which one of the questions i would want to choose now let's just take it a more uh, a stable and a grounded behavior to this particular problem and that's where we step into the explainable data concept now this is where i uh, uh things become a little more uh, uh grounded uh compared to the previous setting where we are still we are defining rules in the evaluator network and generator is still a neural network and the knowledge is is in the way of identifying the relevant passages now in this setting uh the same setting of conversational information seeking on the left hand side if you see is a structure which says that the you agents ask the uh, you, uh, uh, user do you feel nervous and the agent uh, the user says more than half the days now it comes up with a series of questions that it should ask as i said i seek is into practice i seek is being used and it can it is capable of generating those questions now if i have some analyze system right without any safety constraint it might generate these set of questions which are not suitable now these questions are pretty much fine because not very critical mental health topic is being discussed right now but if we deep dive into a more specific mental health setting these questions are not worthy of generations right they are risky right and they might affect someone's mental health setting now what we propose is that this was a very simple strategy that we were thinking is that we know that the probability of any next generated question is depends upon the previous question that's what we were talking about in i seek now what we want to introduce into that setting is a new tag which tells us that whether the if the current tag is if the current question is about the cause then the next generated question should be about the symptoms if the current question is about the symptom the next question has to be about the medication so these rules is what i was rule what are the rules that i was talking about over here right in the evaluator network now, once you have these rules in the places, you can't actually, you can, uh, you're enforcing a particular process in this generation, right? You're enforcing certain processes, but still there's a possibility of error because we are still in the probabilistic world. There is still possibility of errors being coming. Like it's very hard to justify uh, 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 that symptoms and uh, cause might be so connected to each other that it's, uh, it's the cause is even identified as symptoms. Right, so there's a possibility of those errors of this kind. So what we are, what we kind of do, what we kind of uh, thought of is that apart from these set of uh, rules that we are de defining, we introduce another similarity quotient, which is saying that if the generated question matches to one of the questions in the medical questionnaire, then we will approve that particular question. Right, that means is that if the generated question has some semantic similarity with an existing medical questionnaire that's where we can we can ground that generation we can ground the generation in the medical knowledge uh, in the medical re relevance of those questions and that's why we control the way the questions are being generated uh, in, in the in a in a mental health setting so we have this twofold contribution and these twofold contribution are driven by the limitation that i seek had in in a generic domain so i seek was planned out to be developed by with samsung research for their samsung bixby system and it was developed to improve the Bixby's. Uh, uh, if you are using Galaxy S22, probably next year you would be seeing Bixby in live. Uh, I seek in, in live in, in your Samsung Bixby phone. But the uh, I seek was developed for a generic domain and we want to adapt it to a healthcare setting because of the Samsung Health uh, as one of its uh, starting a new venture. So, uh, I seek works very well on a generic domain. When we looked at it into the healthcare domain, there are certain challenges that came into the picture. These are certain challenges do might be occurred in other agents, but they have not been discussed yet to our best of our knowledge. But we are dealing with this particular situation and we want to sort this out to them in the best possible way. And I agree with you if you're thinking that these are heuristics. Perfectly fine. These are heuristics and we are using it as, as a way of 
of uh, preventing the modular models from generating some random questions. Now, in order to do a better job in such a generation, we want to look at the data set of how the people ask questions to uh, in, in a very open domain. So I'm pretty much sure this is a very long post. Probably you won't be, uh, you won't want to read it. Uh, probably you can just highlight, you can just gl uh, glean through the, the, the terms in the red color to figure out uh, what this post would be. Then let's say first post about general anxiety. So the person have is feeling overwhelming, has some fatigue. Uh, maybe the person has a, a, a gradual cognitive decline, is shocking. So these are the terms that are some signals. But when a user, when, an, when a user on a social media platform looks at this post and he wants to help the person. Now, these are the questions that the Reddit users would ask. Now, if you look at these questions, they are like they're magical. They are, these questions are very much uh, uh, human generated compared to a uh, machine generated questions. Now, does the fatigue wax and wane? These questions probably agent would not even come up with a wax and a wane as a, as a combined phrase, right? Have you had your ferritin and iron levels check? Iron levels checks. Now, ferritin and iron levels we know are relevant to when the person having a cognitive uh, issues or he feel he feels low. But these things don't come naturally to an agent. They do not come naturally to a, a language model. But when we see that, okay, why not just put the iSeq into action because we already have a developed system of this kind. We tested iSeq uh, on this particular setting. Now, if you look at this setting. Now, I think was not developed, but we want to test it out because we are always saying that we want, want to make one neural model and we want to test it for various different applications. So this is just one another application that we want to test it with. Application remains the, so the, the, we are still talking about the conversation information seeking. Now in this domain, what we saw that these questions that have been generated are majority, in the, in the majority, they are just being marked as irrelevant, Maybe incoherent, maybe uh, redundant. Incoherent means they're out of out of the order. They are unsafe, and probably they're redundant. These questions are something that uh, that have been already asked before. So, uh, like for example, the first question: What has caused a gradual cognitive decline? Is a physician who needs to answer this question after the conversations, right? And if I look at this question, what does antidepressant work at? So, if you look at the, the, these questions are nothing but the questions coming up from the passage itself because the, we are being trained we are training the models like a like a machine comprehension model they are being they are being trained uh, they have been trained for reading comprehension they are not built to develop curiosity in their behavior so how do we uh, train such a system so the way we thought of bringing iseq into capability in such a setting was so first of all we highlighted these are the four classes of errors that we identified in iSeq, right? Now we want to move this iSeq away further. We want to control what's happening within. So before we can control iSeq, we want to understand what's happening within iSeq right now. So what we did was we started creating an explainable data. When we say explainable data means everything in the data set is understandable. It is very much related to the clinical knowledge and everyone in the uh, expert domain knows about this uh, this particular terms or concepts and phrases so this is a strategy that we followed that we took the reddit content we only content we only filter out the reddit content with these flare tags when you say flare tags means when i say reddit content that means all the posts along with their uh, interactions but in the interaction we only looked at the questions we are not looking at the responses for now we are only looking at the questions because that's what the ic was tasked to now each of this post has these different labels and we are looking at seeking help, seeking advice, requesting support as a more as a, a flare tag that are relevant to our, our, our problem statement. We look, want to look at only all these particular tags. And this leads us, leads us with some set of posts that we want to work with. Definitely I agree with this is a very small set of posts, but these are posts that we know of are pretty much, are very much confident and are useful for training the models. We can, we can train the model in a different sense. We can fine tune the model as well. That's also possible. But this posts are decently, a decent size to work with. Now, how do we, how do we train these, uh, these posts? How do we, how do we train it in a way that it, it fulfills our, our goal 
that the model sh should generate a question in a particular order as well as it is safe. So what we did was we kind of started performing annotations of the sentences. We, we took our help from uh, uh, some psychiatrist. We by, self, we by ourselves uh, looked at various methods of uh, annotating. The demo that uh, Kaushik showed you followed this particular structure and the demo was also constructed on this particular data set on this a certain set of uh, a, a different version of it but the similar data set so what we did with the annotation was we took at we took individual post we took at individual sentence in that post and label it which particular questions in a questionnaire that clinicians use to assess the uh, the severity of mental illness of an individual uh, uh, how which question of that questionnaire is relevant in answering this particular question so when i say first sentence lately i have been feeling really low it answers question two and three and it answers question two and three as yes and yes right so as going back same with the ic thing we know that it's yes and no that is what it is requiring and it will give you the answer completely but you just need to give say that you want to give yes and no responses to it now you also see the set of no's over there that means these are the questions that you don't have answers what i seek was doing was it was only looking at question number one two three and four and nine and generating the questions it didn't look at the nose over here so the nose question that you see over here are the questions whose responses you cannot derive from this particular post you need additional knowledge but i see couldn't find which questions uh, are no and which questions are yes and it was confused between these series of questions and it ended up generating some random ordered questions or maybe the questions which are completely driven by the input text. So that solves one particular problem that uh, the uh, I seek was haphazard, was hallucinated and generated some random series of questions, right? Now, with this questionnaire, another benefit that you are having is now you are only labeling these questions uh, labeling this post with these questions and these questions are approved by clinicians so definitely they are safe so the, the thing that we were trying to do over here the matching is now a part of the explainable data now this data set is explainable in the form that all the mapping over here is with the expert knowledge and you know why the particular thing is yes because that information is presented or highlighted in the input content so that's where we, we, we coined the term that we are looking, we are moving towards a concept called explainable data. Now, uh, when we looked at this uh, uh, ISIC models and it's other, another variants, we, we trained different uh, variants of it. We trained bird classifiers, which are the intrinsic components of ISIC as well on these series of questions. So what we found was, that okay just for, for the information mcc is a matthew correlation coefficient score which is being used to train ml models when the data is imbalanced uh, when the data is imbalanced that means that most of the time some certain set of questions will be answered more often is yes as and some other other question will always be answered as no because they need a more amount of context a more new amount of information so definitely in such a scenario there would be an imbalance as as an as a as a separate gift uh, to the annotation task so when we are dealing with this this particular setting we have series of these questions because we are talking about these nine questions now these are the nine questions and what we saw that in this mcc score is that the model is heavily relying on question number two and question number five and the other questions are just very low correlation scores because these questions are not at all being uh, captured by the model or the majority of the times these questions have been answered as are captured as no that means the model does not pay any attention to these questions at all. It only looks at the question, uh, looks at the question number two and question number five and question number seven because those are the highest uh, correlation questions. Even like if I put a high threshold, even five and seven are the most probable questions. If you look at five and seven, they're like moving or speaking so slowly that other people could have noticed or a fidgety or restlessness. And if you look at the seventh question, I think there's thoughts you would uh, be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way so these are the questions that you always occur in in a mental health setting and they will always be turned out to be yes right so that means your model is in a generative sense when your conversational agent is being trained it is being heavily heavily relied on a particular particular sequence of questions and is just ignoring all other questions so if you train this model if you use this model in practice 
it will always tries to bracket your response to question number two five and seven and if you are uh, if you are asking any if you are providing any information that is relevant to other questions it is most likely that the agent will fall off it will not ask you those questions it will not generate relevant questions so now the the target is that we know that question number two five and seven is very clear to us we want to dri drive the conversation of the agent to all other questions right so that's where that's where we want to where that's where we want to uh, look into and the concept of uh, experimental so this is still a work in progress for us and because that we released this primate 2022 data set for public release uh, the reason is we want to uh, develop training of these models in a in a much more robust sense and the best way is to utilize that which questions are being captured by model that means the questions are answerable by the model itself and the questions which are not answerable by the model are the ones which the model should emphasize on and not on the questions that the uh, the model can answer easily so right now the current state of the art systems are divide are, are are actually trained to answer on the questions that they already know of very easily so that's why it turns out to be a, a response uh, is kind of a comprehension system rather than a uh, a curiosity aware conversational agent that we were been talking about for uh, for quite some time now so at the hood of this uh, experimental data is the structure right the structure is on the left hand side is what you say the ai model that uh, that have been already pre-trained on a very large la language corpora and they have some parametric knowledge and on the right hand side we have the same we have a different set of knowledge where which are being used by humans to do some similar task that the AI was to, uh, was meant to be doing it. Now the idea of the experimental data is to bring these two knowledges knowledge pieces together, find a common point where which where it lies at the intersection of these two components, and that's what we have been trying to do. And as you can see, that we know that the models are capable of answering these questions. We just want to bring them more targeted towards what the age, human would see by bringing the the human behavior of a conversation with a patient a human's way of or experts way of defining which particular uh, uh, how do you assess uh, to what level of severity is a person is having a mental illness right so that's the idea of experimental data now this is this occurs in next conversational setting we have objected we have uh, uh, have objective uh, in an objectively uh, fashion we identified the limitations in a conversational set setting we want to look into another paradigm of uh, of uh, machine learning and ai which is in the classification setting right now we we are still working with the suicide thing we are still working in the mental health but now we are looking into the classification use case as 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 a part of it right so in the classification use case the same problem is there there is a user query uh, a user post just like we have a user post over here there is a user post for the classification task now the classification task that happens right now uh, or that, that have been done before we published the paper in 2021 was that they used to give a label like no risk low risk medium risk and high risk and it has a serious serious uh, consequences to it that i will talk about in the subsequent class uh, subsequent slides but these labels are not in agreement with what clinicians uh, 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 pro uh, project in their in the clinical settings right so what we introduce is that just like in the previous questionnaire we talked about a previous questionnaire which was talking about uh, uh, depression we took another questionnaire which talks about uh, uh, suicidality or suicidal severity if you look at the, uh, 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 the the demo if you if you recall the demo that the previous tutor provided it talks about the five different classes four of those classes are the classes that you can see on the right Suicide indication, ideation, behavior, and attempt. So we want to figure out that given any query, given any post, we want to label the query which all of these these categories because these categories are more diagnostic related compared to simply saying no risk, low risk, or medium risk and high risk. How do we do this, right? So how do we write do it correctly? So certainly we can't do it on a, on our clinical records because they do not have uh they do not have such kind of a variability in the information and most importantly we have a much more wider area of 
of uh, conversations on social media compared to the clinical setting so this is just a just a way of uh, uh, exemplifying that uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, a more like explainable data we want to have a more larger set of data sets to experiment with the model clinical records are relatively smaller in size compared to what you have the humongous size a large scale social media platform so what you see over here is that we constructed a lexicon from this thing on the right we we know that indicator has we introduced that indicator now has one five three five classes in it and these classes have these examples in it right so that means we introduce a more cohesive lexicon that would describe individual classes in the societal severity uh, questionnaire now we take a sim these these uh, terms that you see on the uh, on the bottom are a lexicon that means they are semantically connected parts there is no causality right now there is only correlation the examples are correlated with the classes and we want to see that can we train a near a, a language model a neural language model with these new terms who are connected with these particular classes so we are training a language model pertaining to these terms that means there is already a language model like let's say we have already a bird bird has a vocabulary we are updating the words vocabulary with these terms over here right so that the birds vocabulary gets adapted to these terms now and these terms also get some some numerical representation because at the end we want to do some some sort of classification now once you train these deep language model with these lexicons and there are some words works around it like the retrofitting counterfeiting are the works that have been published along this uh, fine tuning of language models and essentially now we want to do is that now user would not be simply posting in one community he would be jumping around in multiple communities on reddit and not only in reddit it's a human behavior we in for seeking information we go to different outlets right we do go different information outlets so assuming that these are the eight different outlets as you can see over here now the user might have asked the same query in all of these outlets we want to figure out that to what level of the semantic clo uh, closeness occurs between the content that the user have posted in, in the suicide watch where he is right now and the other community where he has he has been posting in the prior uh, history now when you do this what's the benefit so you have a weighted graph now you have a weighted graph over here saying that the the, the, the ssh which is the stop self-harm is very related to our suicide watches how are you getting this course you're getting this course by leveraging a simple cosine similarity metric between the content in the suicide watch and the content in the soft stop cell form so you're computing the cosine similarity between these two domains or these two communities and the cosine the, the way of generating this representation is using this domain language model that has been trained on suicide risk, suicide risk severity lexicon you can replace this language model with depression you can replace this language model with uh, travel history you can travel you can also travel information you can you can change you can train this language model for landmarks data set so that landmarks so that it can gives you information on landmarks so there's a lot of wider possibilities of adaptability but all of this adaptability comes into the with the with the point that you need a structured resource of for training these language models so these are like you can say these are like kind of an implicit rules that you're pushing in inside the language model so the benefit of this is that when you bring this content from other communities to other uh, from from other communities to the current community you might end up changing the label for the person for instance on the left side is a is a content only from his his current post and now if i if i, if I found if i found some other post in other communities which are similar to this we can bring the content from other communities to here and the outcomes kind of change so this is just one example of contextualization that comes as a benefit of doing an explainable data set creation now once you bring this content now you have these all sort of documents that are being here you pass them through different knowledge sources which kind of says that when i pass them through individual knowledge sources it is these knowledge sources are again are again sort of these lexicons uh, for, for for sake of understanding you can assume them to be these lexicons now these are these lexicons and you can contain you can use these content in these lexicons to change the phrases of their input now if you look at sperks p-e-r-c-s is changed to oxycodone 
maybe there so there was a term in this uh, this knowledge base which which relates perks with oxycodone maybe they are synonyms of each other you replace perks with oxycodone because oxycodone is a is a is a clinical term whereas perks is not so you want to just replace these terms together now this is an abstracted post that is constructed now so far what we have done is in, in, infusing this knowledge infusing this variety of knowledge into the very vanilla style uh, english text and the next task would be simply computing the cosines and caution similarity so what are we optimizing over here what are we doing with this kind of data we are optimizing this gaussian similarity now and we are modifying this which word should you choose appropriately for your abstraction so you end up coining a term called medical entity normalization which is a strategy to construct explainable data where the model tries to estimate which is the right word to replace for a particular word right given that it has been it has been uh, associated with the one particular labels over here right so it, the idea is that you want to estimate the right labels over here and these right labels uh, needs uh, uh, have a definitions over here and these definitions are can be computed uh, can help in generating numerical representations using embedding methods so that means every class now have a representation and that's what i say as concept classes because now uh, labels are no more labels they have some definitions and you can compute the embeddings of these two things together and and, and, and create explainable data in a in a more dynamical uh, setting uh, which is uh, which is a novel component of of the neurosymbolic ai let's just, just look at the utility and i would be moving it really quickly on on the utility because of the lack of time uh, uh, and just uh, uh, bear uh, bear with me with some of the examples that i will be showing you right now now if you look at these examples I, and uh, assuming that we all know we are working on human related data set we are going to work on social good domains and for in the social good domain we don't have annotated data right so we want to go with the annotated data we want to do an annotations right so on the left hand side you look at the same po uh, post from the user on the right hand side you look at the highlighted phrases that the annotators have looked at it and they gave the user uh, gave this particular user a label moderate risk and that's how the moderate risk label came in bear with me for i will walk you through how we turn into this moderate risk to an actual label in the uh, in the using the cssrs now when i look at this data we looked at this annotated uh, expert information that is being annotated by the uh, by the annotators and now we use a model like svm like a support vector machine which is very simple i can come i can compute feature importances which is, would be nothing but the car tfidm based vectorizers or vector or bag of words that we want to come up with now this if you look at this bag of words we will look at different words of this uh, in this series of bag of words and you can see none of them match with what the uh, or there's a very few matches between what annotator sees and what a model would see right generally the words that are that a model would see are not phrases together they are mostly like i am is most often uh, uh selected which is has least information uh for the classification task how about you replace svm with a larger model like a cnn convolution neural network because svm is linear right it goes through line by line over there convolution cnn allows you to go along between the sentences right some sort of improvement would be there but there's some sort of loss also over here as you can see isolate was captured by svm now cnn ignores isolate as a, as a point sleep forever sleep is captured by svm but sleep uh, by its term by a simple term has no significance on mental health sleep forever might have some importance uh, towards mental health and sleep forever is completely ignored by cnn now what do we see what we say we went from simple model we went for a larger model and still the uh, the answer is not uh, so still the model is not able to capture the real real essence of the input text so the model's perspective is the person is having a low risk now here is a consequence of having a false negative right the false negative uh, 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 enforces the ai user to have a poor quality treatment 
uh, or it does it does not classify the user as 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 a, as a uh, agent as a person who would need an immediate treatment or immediate consultations right so we kind of what i showed, showed you qualitatively let's just look at uh, in a quantitative sense this is just an svm which is has a recall of 53 percent i would say 53 percent is just a chance recall we kind of introduce uh, our different metrics to introduce uh, over here but uh, i would not go into the, those details but those are like false positive and false negative in a very in a very simple and a many lessons right we improve svm by cnn as i told you we looked at the cnn model and still we are recall is 57 percent still within the chance limit it is still not a, a system that we are we are expecting with what if we are coming up with a, a better matrix which i worked with uh, a person uh, in triple id delhi and we introduce a function called uh, a gambler loss a, fan, a, a, a very interesting and a, a interesting fashion where we say that the things we are working on the things we are we are very well uh, are doing model will take care of it well and good the things which where we, the model is not able to take uh, take care of it just give it to the experts so the experts will be able to train it but the consequence of that work was that most of the post went to the experts so we what you see over here 62 percent recall is on a very small set of post as opposed to a larger series of posts which svm and cnn so in a relatively sense you would say that the recall that we have average recall across this line was still around 60 61 percent definitely an improvement over the top over the other models because of the new loss function that we are introducing but as i said we are not sure what the loss is doing intrinsically inside the model okay so let's just we just stick with it on 62 percent to be the recall over here now what we introduce what maybe there is something wrong with the labels as a question as the point that we started with maybe there's some problem in the labels so what we introduce that let's say we we say we are taking this data set as i said we are taking this data set that's over here the umd university of maryland suicide identity data set we which is not explainable we are turning it into an explainable data set and how are we doing it we are looking at the same societal severity rail scale and we know these are the labels that have been already provided to us we introduce a new set of labels which i already introduced in the previous slides that's just had indication, ideation, behavior, and attempt. Now, every of these classes have now a definitions associated with it, right? And as I said, the labels with definitions are concept classes, and they do they work magically. And how do they do it? The first thing is that we want to bracket the the phrases within the uh, input content which have some significance or connections to these labels. As I said, these labels are uh, have definitions in it. So we can compute the similarity between phrases in the input and the definitions over here. And that's what this bracketing tells you. These are the phrases that you pick. And these phrases occur exactly as it, some of the phrases like which is in the dark color are the ones which exist as it is in this lexicons. And some of the ones which are in the brown color are the ones which the model picked because of some phrase uh, uh, extraction mechanism that we brought in. So phrases are extracted in a very simple sense of constituency parsing. And nowadays, even if, uh, you can even use Berkeley's neural parser that also extracts a good set of phrases out of from the input text. So once we have this uh, concept phrases, now we are not exactly the same as what uh, the uh, annotators would have identified, but we sort of we are very close by compared to what we were doing earlier where we were completely uh, kind of uh, taking the content in a native sense. Now, since we have highlighted this, these phrases from the only the first two classes, we kind of highlight them to be yellow class for now. Uh, and assuming that we know that even if my model does not work very nicely, I know that these are the two, these one of these two classes would be the class to, uh, in which the person would be uh, suffering from. So the indication is a low risk, ideation is a medium risk, uh, and also uh, behavior is a like a sorry ideation is a moderate risk behavior is a medium and suicide attempt is a high risk uh, issue so what we essentially did was we brought some additional knowledge over here as you can see this highlighting over here is from additional knowledge which is coming from the definition of these labels this is not given to the model model has no clue model is still using the labels that were given which were these levels no risk low risk high moderate risk and high and severe risk we replace these risk with these labels on the right 
now when you bring these things you need to bring along with it the definitions of these labels as well and that's where we introduce cnn with a semantic embedding loss where we say that we are now bringing the definitions of these labels as a similarity function between what the model predicts at the outermost layer and compute the representation the, the similarity between the representation that model generated with the definitions are in this, these labels and then the model should train so rather than doing a simple cross entropy loss or a square loss which is a traditional function in the cnn we replace it with a semantic embedding loss and this is what the definitions would be beneficial in so we have new highlighted regions over here the the new highlighted regions that you see are in the are in the uh, pink color where we looked at sleep forever nice today's hopelessness all coming up highlighted you can pretty much tell tell me that this is a, a, a kind of a biasing the model on a particular sequence but we are doing it with a general reason that this human biases are quantifiable these biases are coming as a part of the knowledge that you are adding in our in a very specific and on a, in a very specialized domain so this is just an illustration of that uh, how this loss looks like which is pretty much by, uh, just the embedding representation between the two and we say that in now we we look at this moderate risk coming out as an example but interesting interestingly we also get this vector at the bottom we say that there is a possibility of indication but the ideation is very high and this gives us gives the user a chance to look at the green highlighted regions as well as the pink highlighted regions because the pink ones are, are relatively directed towards a moderate risk and the greens are the ones which have which just are just indication of or social indications so we you see both of them to be highlighted regions as an as an outcome so this kind of tells you that we are we are moving ahead with the with a better classification but at the same time we are giving the uh, uh, stakeholders or the end users the the phrases which they can relate very well with because these phrases can have exact mapping in that lexicon that experts have already built so we just brought in their resources into the model so that's why we this kind of like we can say that those are the most symbolic structures of uh, of uh, of uh, knowledge that we are bringing into the neural functioning of existing deep near, deep learning models so this work so far to my to my best of my knowledge i haven't seen any work crossing the state of the art uh, which is the 84% and most importantly i have been able to uh, extend this work more towards explainability part of it but this work is right now the the work on on uh, suicide risk severity detection so we we talked about we we got the explainable data from this setting now looks at the explainability part of it like okay explainable data is good but why are why manas is saying explainable data what's a most what's a uh, uh, take away behind it so essentially what we do do it is that we know that these high, these words were highlighted from from the model right and we already know that these words are connected to the some of the lexicons right and we would just want to do an automated structure we say that these nodes are now the leaves of some tree some knowledge tree are are just the leaf nodes and when you go up the hierarchy of a knowledge structure these are the ids of those knowledge uh, where this knowledge uh, is stored so if you go up the hierarchies you see that they all are connected to the concept of medical uh, state findings you know that these are like a uh, uh, sleep forever is related to feeling suicidal abandoned is used to is associated with feeling abandoned and uh, these are terms you can see are existing in the in the input text but they were not captured because they were not highlighted by the existing neural uh, model behaviors and we say that all of these things if you do multi hop traversal which is not a very complicated task it's a long end task right it's a, it's a very pretty fast uh, appropriate uh, process of of traversal if we traverse we traverse and stop at a point where we get a label uh, in societality domain that is very similar to the label in one of our classes so by this traversal by itself by this traversal i can confirm whether my model gave the right label uh, to the person uh, as opposed to just giving some random label so you're confirming or you are even get developing the confidence of your uh, of your model so uh, uh okay 
Okay, so with this uh, approach, I think with the limit time that I have, I would just rush through it. So this is uh, uh, explainability as a metric that we introduce in this work, which tells you that how many times your model is generating a uh, 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 generating a content uh, uh, that is in agreement. So is is giving a label that is in agreement with annotators, and how many times it is is in disagreement with annotators. So this. This kind of metric that we introduced the perceived risk measure was a new metric uh, to assess the explainable data because we wanted to check how many times the prediction that the model is giving is related to uh, uh, is related to the uh, is in agreement with the annotators and how many times it is in disagreement with the annotators. So if the annotators themselves disagree a lot, well, we won't penalize. We, we should not be penalizing the model for their misclassification. So what we introduced was rather than having this uh, very crude loss that we were talking about the semantic uh, embedding loss, we want to introduce uh, a new set of loss, which is uh, uh, which is like a, which is defined by the perceived risk measure, where we kind of loosen in the semantic embedding losses by introducing uh, annotators disagreement and agreement in a classification. We can do the agreement and disagreement because we have an expert source now in line for us that we, that we are comparing with. And this is uh, uh, this loss function is pretty uh, uh, as a dot product of of uh, i and i uh, one and two, where one is uh, quantifying the disagreement and the two is quantifying the agreement uh, in the predictions. So this is what we looked in into the system that the semantic embedding loss uh, fare very well with this particular metric as opposed to other studies that have been developed so far. So we, we introduced, we kind of introduced this loss in all of the prior work as well. And we also introduced this loss into the semantic embedding loss as an additional factor. And if you add more labels to your uh, data set and those labels have again definitions, you do better off by using such kind of an explainable data set creation structures. And altogether we found that most of the time, 86% of the time, our, our predictions were in agreement with the annotators. When we looked at our, our uh, holdout test set, I think it was even larger than, than what we were trained on. So it seems a, a, a very plausible uh, approach to uh, mental health care when we are dealing with AI systems. So with this, where we stand right now is what I am that also winds up the tutorial for the day is we end up in defining a new paradigm of within the natural language processing called knowledge intensive language understanding some of the classes or some of the domains where knowledge plays a critical role and it should be incorporated as opposed to glue tasks which have been the common benchmark task in in assessing the natural language processing systems but they do not contribute towards explainability that's one of the uh, key criteria that we wanted to touch upon. And for developing neurosymbolic AI systems, it's most important to that you that you dynamically bring together knowledge as well as improve upon the the metrics to introduce new metrics that actually assess the infusion or the inclusion of the external knowledge. So over the time, we built different data sets for summarizing clinical interviews. We looked at uh, the data sets for assessing the societal, societal severity, as we talked about in pretty much. We also looked at the user language paraphrase corpus, which is a new set of paraphrase corpus that we with, that we came up with with human with the user related use uh, like high school students constructed corpus uh, to study uh, uh, the analogy component that Kaushik was talking about. We discussed the conversation information seeking scenario, and we are currently working towards. Uh, knowledge uh, process knowledge based natural language generation in each of these cases there are a separate seek uh, component of knowledge that is being incorporated and also there's a new set of metrics that were introduced as a part of assessing that knowledge infusion or knowledge inclusion into the neural infrastructure is is done in a neat and a transparent way and it is actually functional uh, in, in practice so with this, I want to end my today's tutorial and I really thank uh, National Science Foundation who have been generously supporting our, our research. And I also support uh, the Knowledge Infused Learning Grant, which we which we want for our work uh, in on experimental data set creations, uh, process knowledge, 
deep knowledge infusion, shallow infusion, semi-deep infusion in the context of mental health care. I uh, open the stage for questions and answers. And you can find all the resources that I discussed today on AIC.ai slash neuron. And any questions for me? Anybody? Thank you, Manas. That was very, very uh, interesting. Any questions? So, if nobody has a question, I have a question, Manas. Uh, when yeah. you, so, when you have this graph uh, which captures common knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if there is an error in that graph, then that can have catastrophic consequences. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. So, Agreed. so how do you create that graph and how do you check that for us? So that's where the things get uh, a little bit complicated and that's why I, I talked about two different concepts. We I talked about the concept of explainable data and I talked about the concept of, uh, of uh, using concept and knowledge graph. So the concept and knowledge graph might be erroneous, might have some errors. But the explainable data would actually help you in controlling that the knowledge inclusion is appropriate or not. So if you do, if you have a data that is coming haywire and you have no way of controlling uh, controlling a source and if there is no way of understanding whether this data set has has a particular uh, provenance, then you cannot blame uh, knowledge because you cannot trust whether your data set is appropriately labeled or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Jason. Talk. But just uh, have you, uh, like, like your uh, application, have you used it with actual uh, suicidal users and so on? Yes. Yes. So, uh, all the part of this resource that I have showed with you, uh, I have opened the sample for public use, but a majority part of the systems are, are in the deployment stage at Prisma Health in South Carolina. And I seek is already a part of the uh, big system. So uh, I'm still working on moving the IC for the mental health setting, but that's uh, still in a work in progress. Any other questions? Okay, in that case, thank you so much, Manas. Uh, also, thank you. Thanks to all your uh, co speakers, including Kaushik. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye and good night. Bye.